The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 121. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Thank you for joining us on the EL. Today we have Linda Rottenberg, author of Crazy as a Compliment, The Power of Zigging When Everyone Else Zags. This is one of my favorite interviews of 2014. Uh, Linda is a phenomenal storyteller, and you'll learn uh, you'll learn that as as she goes through the interview and talks about some of the different stories, while also sharing the entrepreneur's mindset. So, a very powerful interview. So, let's dive in with Linda. Welcome, Linda, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. It's great to be here. Will you take just a moment before we take a deep dive into the book and and take some time to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally? Sure. So I'm Linda Rotenberg. I grew up in Newton, Mass, outside of Boston. And I guess I, I would say I grew up in a pretty traditional household. My parents met as high school sweethearts in Rhode Island. And my dad uh, went on to be a lifelong lawyer. My mom raised three kids. And I always said that my parents were very loving and very risk averse. And so this rubbed off on me. And I sort of was set to go the the narrow expected path. I went to Harvard for college, went to Yale for law school, but I arrived at law school and pretty quickly discovered that I had no interest in practicing law. And so that uh, search for something different and um, you know that I would find more fulfilling sort of set me on this this journey. Linda, I, I heard a siren in the background. Are they coming to get you or is that is that someone else? <laughs> I hope not yet. Uh, I, I, I live in New York City, so just to, yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll double back on my story, but basically I co-founded, you know, eight, close to 18 years ago, uh, an organization called Endeavor that supports high growth or what we call high impact entrepreneurs around the world. So we're now based in New York City, but operate in 22 countries. We've screened over 40,000 entrepreneurs and selected as of this week, we had a selection panel in Miami and we've selected 1,000 entrepreneurs from over 650 companies and helped them grow their businesses. And today they're generating over $7 billion a year and they've created over 400,000 jobs. So it's really been my lifelong passion to work with entrepreneurs and to really help them get unstuck whenever they get stuck. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing all that. And now let's jump right into your book, Crazy is a Compliment, which was just made available not too long ago, actually, October 2014. And Linda, we're going to move quickly, but we're going to cover the top questions that our reader slash listener would love to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing Crazy is a Compliment? Well, I mentioned that I work with over a thousand entrepreneurs in 22 countries. And so part of the inspiration was just the idea that I had seen the same patterns and pitfalls of entrepreneurs, not necessarily at the startup phase, but at the scale up phase at what I call the go big phase, when people had to move from, you know, working solo or with friends and family to really hiring and scaling a business. And so part of the inspiration was trying to see if I could sit down and and uh, capture all the, the lessons. But I didn't just want to write for people who were involved with high growth companies because I started realizing that everybody needs to think and act like an entrepreneur today, whether they have a you know, home-based business that they're hoping will you know, provide more of a lifestyle, a lifestyle uh, employment, or whether they're in the nonprofit sector but need to take more risks, or whether they're inside large companies uh, that really need some shaking up from the inside. So I really wrote this idea because I feel like we all have dreams, but we all hold ourselves back. And so beyond anything else, crazy is a compliment is sort of this manifesto for how we can give ourselves permission uh, to go forward with our own crazy dream. So what would you say makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? 
Uh, a few things. Number one, I look at the journey, the entire journey of the entrepreneur. I divide it up to, into three sections, get going, go big, and go home. I think a lot of people look at just the startup phase, and I've looked a lot at not only the startup, but the scale up and, and the, the go big and then going home, um, merging our passions with our, with our families. And I also really wanted to showcase lots of different examples. I feel like so many of the books and lessons about entrepreneurship feature the same uh, companies. They're mostly tech. They're mostly based in Silicon Valley. They're mostly boys in hoodies. And so I, I had this mantra that you don't have to have a hoodie to be an entrepreneur. And I really tried to showcase so many uh, different stories, as I said, not only with uh, you know, people coming from different countries and with di different ages and, and both genders, but also people in tech, but also in more traditional industries, people looking to go big, but people also looking to create more lifestyle businesses and people, as I mentioned earlier, who are trying to shake up existing corporations, but still keep their jobs. So it's really about how entrepreneurship today is a skill set and a mindset. And it's not just my own journey, but it's the journey of you know thousands of people I've lived and work with around the world and some more famous people um, whose stories I kind of unpackaged, unpacked and packaged in a different way. And Linda, how would you suggest the reader engage with your book? Is this one they can jump in and jump out based on, you know, grabbing nuggets as they go? Or was it really designed to be read from front to back? It is meant for jumping in and jumping out. I write like I talk, so um, I imagine myself having a you know a coffee conversation with the reader. The last chapter is written as a letter to my daughters. I know some people who've started with that. I know people who are giving the book to uh, kids who are graduating from high school or college to give them a sense of how to think big. I know people who have gotten something going, but they're they're at that sort of getting stuck in the go big phase, so they jump right to that section. I know people who are giving it to coworkers to try to get them to have the courage to move forward with their crazy ideas and, and, and who look at the beginning phases uh, most. So I, I hope everyone will take what they need. Um, I also did the audio tape so they can actually hear me talk it out if they'd rather download it. Uh, but it's really about meeting you wherever you are. I really wanted this to be uh, with with the reader in mind and not just, again, it's not just my story. I've met with so many different people who have so many different dreams and it's about meeting you wherever you're feeling stuck and hopefully giving you the, the inspiration and some tools to get unstuck. All right. So Linda, now that we know the background, some background or even the purpose of the book, let's take a deep dive into the content. Will you take the next, like I said, five, eight, ten minutes and really give this future reader a great idea of what they can expect from your book? Sure. I will love to. So I will uh, share some of the lessons and stories from each of these sections that I mentioned, the get going, go big, and go home. And also, I should say at the outset that I mentioned that I wrote for different people in mind, um, I personally think the word entrepreneur is, uh, it's gone from underused to overused, and it's clunky to begin with, and now we've started adding all these qualifiers like social entrepreneur and intrapreneur and mompreneur and kidpreneur. So I said, you know what, I'm going to make this a little simpler and hopefully more fun, and I'm going to create four different entrepreneur species that we're going to talk about. So let me just introduce those because they come, they're recurring throughout the book. Uh, the first are the gazelles. These are what we know as the high growth companies. About only four to six percent of companies here in the U.S. qualify as gazelles that double every um, every four years, but they're the ones responsible for most of uh, net job creation. Now, when we think of gazelles, we always think of the tech companies from Google to Facebook to GoPro, and I included a number of those stories, but I also wanted to talk about very high growth companies that I've seen around the world that are in more traditional industries, food and beverage and uh, retail and manufacturing and services. The second group are um, what some people think of as the social entrepreneurs. I call them dolphins working in either government or the nonprofit. And dolphins are known as very cooperative animals. They're very social, but you harm their environment or their, their pod, is, which is their, their immediate network, and watch out. There are no pushovers. And my point is that even in the government and social sector, we need dolphins making some waves. We need some entrepreneurial thinking. The third type are the butterflies. 
These are what used to be known as mom and pop, but today four out of 10 Americans will spend part of their careers working for themselves. We know that the number of independent contractors is blossoming and the number of people starting businesses out of their garages or in the kitchens that maybe are going to hire you know, under 10 people, but they never want it to explode and, and compromise lifestyle. So butterflies aim for freedom, they aim for uh, independence, but today they also need to spread their wings because even butterflies are going on Shark Tank or getting square readers to be able to sell their goods at the farmer's market and take credit cards. So you have to uh, think big, even if you're a butterfly. And the last category, which I have to say, has become my personal favorite after the book is are the skunks. These are, uh, I hate the word intrapreneur, but I think that today uh, the top rate of big companies has doubled, meaning that no one's job is really safe because no one's company is safe. And yet so many CEOs believe that they're giving incentives to people in uh, every level of management to take risks and to be innovative. And yet people are terrified that they're going to lose their budgets or their jobs. So named after Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, I wanted to show examples of these people really making change inside companies. And I, I say that you have to be a skunk because your main goal is to stink up the joint. Um, so that's that's really the overview and the different type of entrepreneur species. Um, but let's start with get going. And what I've learned working in 22 countries around the world where I personally thought that the biggest barriers to getting going with an entrepreneurial idea would be financial or they would be structural or they would be cultural. And I was wrong on all three counts. The biggest barrier to getting going and being an entrepreneur is psychological. It, we hold ourselves back. Uh, we don't give ourselves permission to launch our ideas because we're worried about what other people will think. And you know, I, I've come to believe that entrepreneurship is, is like what the great golfer Bobby Jones said about his sport, which is that it's a game played on the five inch course, the distance between your ears. And it turns out the first person we have to convince to move forward is the hardest one, and, and it is us. So I tell a lot of stories about how people can, can overcome their own fears. And in my own case, you know, I had this idea. I was living in Latin America after realizing that I didn't want to go to, you know, into law. And uh, one day I was late for a meeting and took a taxi ride and learned my, my taxi driver had an engineering degree. So I asked him, excuse me, but what are you doing driving a taxi? And he explained that the government wasn't hiring and none of the big companies were hiring. I said, no, 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 but why aren't you starting a business? And I couldn't think of the word in Spanish for entrepreneur. And, he, and the taxi driver kept using the word empresario, which means a big businessman, which at that point had connotations of having government contracts and you know, secret Swiss bank accounts, and it was not very highly regarded. And I realized that at that moment, there wasn't a word in Spanish or Portuguese for entrepreneur. Today there is. Today, if you grow up, the word emprendedor has really come into the lingo in part because of Endeavor's work. But 20 years ago, that didn't exist. So I, I sort of had this aha moment. I said, oh, my God, no wonder no one is starting anything or taking risks because there's no culture here that supports risk-taking. So I had this idea to, to start this organization to help entrepreneurs around the world. Um, went back home told my idea to people, they all thought it was terrible, and uh, met up with this other quote-unquote crazy kid named Peter, and our first meeting of Endeavor was at my parents' kitchen table. And when they heard us, they already knew I had taken a year off, they thought it was my Peace Corps year and that I would then get a job in a law firm, and when they heard us plotting this global organization, you know, they, they came over and reminded me, you know, you don't have a trust fund. You have to be financially independent. And my mother, who's very on message about us producing grandchildren, suggested that I shouldn't be getting on all these planes if I ever wanted to find a spouse. And, and she said very, very nicely and sweetly but that my eggs were not getting any younger. And, and I remember this moment when, oh, my God, do I do what's safe and expected or do I do what's unsafe and unknown? And it's this juncture between fear and hope. And 
I chose hope and I, I, I made a note that I was going to devote myself to helping other dreamers face that own moment when they had to make that decision to, to, to take that, you know, unexpected path. And so many people I've come across, as I mentioned, say that the scariest thing was not only confronting loved ones, but really allowing themselves to take that first leap. So that's, that's the beginning phase, but then I found that our notion of entrepreneurs, particularly where it comes to risk, is really wrong. I think we imagine entrepreneurs as these swashbuckling daredevils who go all in and bet the farm and risk it all. And the entrepreneurs that I have met over the years are risk minimizers, not risk maximizers. And after that first leap of faith, Really good entrepreneurs spend their days trying to minimize every type of risk. And so when I, when I talk to people and I, I ask them what's preventing them from getting going, they say, well, I have a mortgage, I have kids, I have you know, school loans to pay off. And what I say is, first of all, it doesn't take that much money to get going. It turns out that over half of the, four, of the Inc. 500 companies, the fastest growing companies here in the U.S., started with $5,000 or less. With crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, it's, it's become even easier to get some funding. That's number one. Number two is that I think eventually you have to kind of go all in, but not at the beginning. And some of the best entrepreneurs are people who keep their day jobs for a while until their ideas take off. So Sarah Blakely of Spanx uh, ended up selling fax machines for two years until... Oprah Winfrey made Spanx her one of her favorite things, and Sarah Blakely said, okay, now I can quit my job. Uh, Phil Knight of Nike, who's more of a just-do-it guy than the Nike founder? He spent almost a decade doing other people's taxes while someone else sold the shoes. So you can, you know, start small. You can, you know, wager a few chickens, but you don't have to bet the farm. And in the context of, of the skunks, the entrepreneurs, I found that a big... Uh, mistake people make is they rush to the boss, they rush to create a business plan, or they rush to build a PowerPoint too quickly. And the people that I studied who were successful at launching new products or new initiatives inside companies went stealth, committed maybe 10 or 20 percent of their time, didn't do it with very much money at all, and they started amassing proof points, and only then do they go to the boss. So so the lesson there is stop planning, start doing. So I think that at the beginning phases, just to recap this, it's about you know, not letting the best ideas die in the mind, but getting going, uh, giving yourself you know, permission to move, and then moving pretty quickly, but at every step of the way, figuring out how to minimize uh, your risks. Um, one other lesson I, I learned, there's a, a study by Ipade University in Babson, I believe, and they studied uh, hundreds of entrepreneurs and said, what was the biggest mistake or regret you had? And the answer was selling to friends and family too quickly and telling friends and family too quickly about their ideas. And I think the, the, the issue is that friends ha and family have our interests at heart, but they're often not reliable narrators. They're either trying to butter us up, telling us we'll have the best idea, and of course it'll be a billion dollars, or more likely... They tell us this is the worst idea ever and that we can't do it, that we'll go bankrupt, that, and they're really just anxious on our behalf. The, the founders of Gap, there's a wonderful story of how they went to their friends when they had the first catalog, that, that, um, sorry, Banana Republic, I'm sorry. So the Banana Republic grew on these quirky catalogs selling these safari clothing um, back in the 80s. And when they took it off the printer, Friends told them that this was the worst idea they'd ever seen, that they couldn't possibly mail it out, and they really better look for a real job again. And Banana Republic almost never got started, but the, the founders, Mel and Patricia Ziegler, decided to defy their friends. They sent out the catalogs, and years later, when they sold Banana Republic to The Gap, that's why I got mixed up and said The Gap earlier, The Gap bought it because of these quirky catalogs, for, um, for the most part. So we know the saying, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, friends don't let friends test drive their ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
And in this book, I also tell a, a, a story of, of some of the dark arts of entrepreneurship. People think you have to have connections and you need venture capitalists. And most people are outsiders when they start. And an effective technique or strategy that I don't think is discussed very much, but which I use and many, many successful entrepreneurs deploy, is the art of stalking. That stalking is an underrated startup strategy. Um, and uh, I tell some great stalking stories in the book. Uh, the next real phase, um, still in the get going phase, is about bumping into walls and hitting uh, the first bump in the road after we get some traction, or sometimes through no fault on our own, uh, the chaos emerges, whether it's an economic crisis, whether it's in some countries a political crisis, whether it's the market for whatever idea we have just completely is disrupted. And I've come to believe that stability, which we often prize too much in this country, stability is really the friend of the status quo. And if entrepreneurship is about disrupting the status quo, then actually some chaos is what we need. And um, whether it was Walt Disney, who had just had his beloved cartoon, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, his first successful start cartoon ripped out from under him, his cartoonist stolen away, um, and was just in the worst kind of moment of his career, he got on a train and realized that not only had Oswald the Rabbit been stolen, but all the cute animals had already been taken. And so what does he do? He takes out some stationery and starts drawing a mouse with velvet pants and red buttons. And this is, of course, you know, Mickey Mouse. And so what I always say is we like things to be smooth and the status quo, but I, but I tell people, would you rather at the end of the day have Oswald the Rabbit or Mickey Mouse? Mm. And, and I tell, I won't give it away, but one of my favorite stories in the entire book comes in my moment of, of chaos, and it's the story of really how modern champagne was, was created, and it's, and it's from very unexpected persons. That, that I will leave some mystery on, but that, that really ends section one. And then I move into the go big phase, which is really what Endeavor, my organization, is known for. We focus on scale-ups, not startups. And at the scale-up phase, uh, I have a lot of sections about work, knowing your entrepreneur personality. I worked with Bain & Company on a 200 questionnaire, uh, question questionnaire to, to really delve into different personality types. These are different than your entrepreneur species, but these are your strengths and weaknesses of a leader as a leader. Uh, I created a, a, a shortened version that you can get on lindarotenberg.com. And it, this is really important because what I found working with entrepreneurs is that they, as they make the shift from startup to scale up, they have to move from being a startup founder where it's all about them. It's all about their idea, their passion, them giving themselves permission, them rallying people to building a team, to being a leader, to delegating, to finding mentors. Those are different skill sets. And I think that people often try to model themselves after Steve Jobs or you know one or two people that they, that they think were iconic entrepreneurs. And it's a mistake because really what they need to do is know themselves and know what their own strengths are and also what their own weaknesses are. And I found that if you can uncover that, you can kind of build a team around you that accentuates your strengths and, and also covers for some of your weaknesses. So I spent a lot of time talking about that and then, um, and then also about lessons on leadership. And I think that most leadership books are written for corporate titans. And what I say is that you know, Jack Welch has as much... Uh, you know, in common with the with the scale up or startup entrepreneur, as you know, uh, a, you know, a major aircraft fighter jet has with you know a skateboard. That really, that these leadership books are often not as relevant for people who are really at that scale up moment. And so, what I did for that is look at across all these entrepreneurs that I've worked with and said, okay. Where are people getting stuck and, and, and what's allowing them to move forward? And just a couple of things from there. Um, one is the notion of failure. I think that we talk a lot about failure and how that's you know, a good thing to at least 
not discouraged in the entrepreneurial setting, but I found that how do you employ that in an institution? Because when I talk to employees of companies, whether they're startups or whether they're multinationals, people are terrified. And so when I looked at companies that successfully had allowed people to take risk and to fail, two that really stood out were one is uh, the Indian company Tata Group, Ratan Tata, who ran the largest conglomerate in India, a few years ago was retiring. And it's a $100 billion company and with many different groups. And in his last year of chairman, he instituted across all the groups a prize for the best failed idea. I think every company should implement this and have a prize for the best failed idea because it says that, you know what, you, it's okay if you try something, it doesn't work out, we're going to at least, you know, recognize that. The other company that I, I didn't really know the history, but um, WD-40 started because a, a scientist named Norm Larson in the 1950s was trying to solve the problem of rust in the aerospace industry. And so he knew it had something to do with water displacement, and he tried the first formula, didn't work, second formula, didn't work, 39 formulas fail, 40th formula gets it right, brings it to general dynamics. It's working well in aerospace, and the employees like it so much they're sneaking it home in their pails so they can fix their rusty, you know, uh, car doors. So Norm Larson's no dummy. He's like, wait a minute, maybe there's a consumer application. So he decides to create a company, and when thinking of the name, he goes back to his lab books and looks and says, water displacement, 40th formula. So the idea of failure, right, is inherent in his brand. And today the CEO says, all right, in honor of our heritage, we're going to have learning moments. We're going to talk about, for every decision, what went wrong in addition to what went right. So but I love this idea that as a leader, there are actually specific ways you can encourage people to, you know, to try. Um, there are many lessons uh, but I, but I want to just focus on one more because it's the one that was really hardest for me to learn and the one that was most personal uh, in this section. And that is that as a female leader, you know, we have 350 full-time uh, employees at Endeavor spread across 22 countries and uh, work with a thousand entrepreneurs and, and thousands of mentors around the world. And I assumed that I had to be very self-sufficient and independent and strong and, of course, separate my personal life from my professional life. And two things ended up changing this. First, I got pregnant with identical twins and had to go on bed rest for 12 weeks. And so there was that, that moment when life kind of stopped. But then uh, a few years later, so now six years ago, um, my husband, the journalist Bruce Feiler, got diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer, uh, osteogenic sarcoma. And we knew he was going to spend a year in chemotherapy. He was going to have a 17-hour surgery to replace his entire femur. And um, it was a complicated surgery that had been performed only twice before. And so I knew that just as Endeavor was expanding, I, I wasn't going to get on any plane. But what never surprised me was that the board and my team just stepped up and we didn't miss any mark. But what surprised me was later on when, when it looked like Bruce was doing better and I came back to work full time. I, at that point, you know, people were asking me how my girls were doing and how he was doing and how I was coping. And I just was much more open, much more vulnerable than I had ever been. And I cried on occasion. I just, um, I just completely shifted my whole philosophy because I, I couldn't hide it. And so the personal professional wall came crashing down and, and I was kind of an open book and two employees came up to me and they said, you know, we always admired you, but we thought you were superhuman. And they did not mean this in a good way. They meant this in an unrelatable way. And <laughs> I... <laughs> I realized, and then they said, you know, now that we know who you are as a person, now that we see your, your, your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities, now we'll follow you anywhere. Mm. And so my lesson for that as leaders is we have to be less super and, and more human. And 
then that leads really to the third part of the book, which is about going home. And so many people I meet today, fathers and mothers, you know, people with aging parents, you know, want to have thriving professional lives that, you know, last, uh, you know, in order to save for retirement, many of us have to, most of us have to work well past the age of 65, but want to combine that with the people we love. And I remember being at a top Wall Street firm and speaking to the whole firm, but meeting first with the top 30 women. And they were very surprised that I talk about my daughters a lot in my speeches. And when I asked why this was surprising, they said, well, we won't even put photos of our children up on our desk for fear of being disloyal to the firm. Oh, wow. And this, it, yeah, isn't that crazy? So it went on and an hour later at the end, they asked me if I had any advice. And I said, yeah, you know, put out your family photos. Um, and, and I really believe that the, the best companies of the future, and I know this is what millennials want. I know this is what boomers want. And I think that the top companies in order to compete for talent are going to be those that allow people to balance um, being being good parents, being good children, and and uh, you know partners as well as being producers and and those that don't, I think eventually are going to lose out because I, I I just believe that this um, this is just too important. And my girls, I wrote the last chapter of the book. I dedicated it to uh, Tybee and Eden, my nine and a half year old daughters. And they give you the best advice uh, I've ever gotten, which is that you can be an entrepreneur for a short time, they told me, but you are a mommy forever. And I think that's really important because I think that sometimes we talk about entrepreneurship in business books as if we're only dealing with, you know, one side of a person. And uh, studies of, of the, by the leading parenting sites have shown that men, too, want to be there to tuck in their kids. They want to go to those little league games and the... Uh, and the ballet recitals. And I think that uh, being able to combine, as I said, our, our, our dreams and our passions with, with going home um, is, is really, uh, I think, what, what aligns, our, uh, aligns people's passions and values. And the last thing I'll say is to, to end, and then happy to answer any questions, but I'll, I'll answer uh, what I maybe should have began with, uh, which is why it's called crazy is a compliment, um, and that is that every dreamer I know at one point has been called nuts, whether it was crazy Henry Ford, who was tinkering in his garage and people thought the Model T would never happen, whether it was more recently with the founder of Alibaba, which was one of the largest IPOs in history, if not the largest, and he was known as Crazy Jack. He was this English teacher in China and was basically creating the online yellow pages and people called him crazy jack to the creators at microsoft of the xbox their colleagues these are skunks within microsoft and their colleagues dubbed it coffin box um and the xbox went on to be hugely successful and and so what i say is look if you're gonna rock the boat you have to be expect to be called off your rocker i was known for a decade in latin america as la chica loca as the crazy girl when i started <laughs> <laughs> and the name carried over to the middle east when we launched there and so the corollary to this is that if you're not being called crazy you're probably not thinking big enough Wow. So, Linda, I don't even know where to go from here because you've talked about so much powerful content. And you also have a very, uh, I, I would say, I don't know if anyone has ever told, told you this, but you have a gift for, uh, for storytelling. I could, I could have listened to you go on for hours and hours and hours and take us through even more. Uh, and now you definitely have me intrigued. I got I to gotta look up the, uh, the champagne story um, that, that you referenced. But uh, you really have a, a, a talent. I don't know if it's natural. You had to work at it, but for storytelling, and you did a fantastic job. Your book covers an unbelievable amount of information, and it's not just quantity, but it's got so much quality. You know, the entrepreneur mindset, and and I don't know. Any anyway, I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of everything you just went over, and and uh, and also just I'm sitting here going, you know, you, you're making me think of things in some different ways. Even the word, I, I agree with you. The word entrepreneur, what you started off with at the very beginning. It, it, technically, there's no even American word. You know, isn't that a, is it a French word? 
Is it like, yeah, you although, know? although George Bush said there was no word for entrepreneur in French, which is... <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and it was very academic-y until, a, until about 20 years ago. No one really yeah. used it very much, and now it's overused. Yeah, yes. I think, look, it, it, it goes back full circle to what you were saying about how does this book differ. I really wanted this to be accessible. I did want to tell stories. I did want to break down what seems like a daunting process into manageable chunks. You know, I have this... Uh, this subsection of the book called Eat the Elephant One Bite at a Time. Mm. And and that entrepreneurship can seem like this big, scary thing. And yet, if you break it down into manageable chunks, you can do it. And I think that sometimes, while it's fantastic to hear the stories of Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Elon Musk of Tesla, I find that only focusing on those stories discourages people as much as it encourages them. And uh, that as much as these radical innovations change the world, a series of mini innovations, what I call minivations, are, are really what me moves the needle more. And so that's really what I wanted to do is tell the stories of people who saw pain points in their everyday lives and just set out to find solutions and in the process, you know, ended up making huge change. So Linda, I think you just kind of started to dive into our next question, which I think I, I love the question, but I also think it, it's it's kind of a, a difficult one to answer based on everything that you just gave us. And really, it's just if the reader can only take away one concept, principle or action item out of your entire book or everything that you just took us through over the last 10 minutes, what would you want that to be? It would be that any dream can be made possible if you give yourself permission to think big and take the initial risk and then spend the rest of your time de-risking that risk. Mm. It's this combination of taking risk and reducing risk. I think to me, that is the essence of entrepreneurship. It's a psychological endeavor and it's about going back and forth between taking risks and reducing risks. I've never heard it put like that, and I, and I, and I like that a lot. And this next question, I, I could almost just use what you just said perfectly, but I'm asking, do you have a favorite quote from your book? Um, oh, there are hmm. – do I have a favorite quote from my book? Um, well, apart from the ones I've already used, like, if you're not called crazy, then you're not thinking big enough. Um, yes. Stalking is an underrated startup strategy. <laughs> no, I, I think that, um, no, seriously. Uh, I actually like, I, I've pulled several out of what you've, uh, are, out of this interview so are, far. <laughs> are you tell me that, yeah, some people like you don't need a hoodie to be an entrepreneur. Some people like the, um, you know, the, the, the hardest person to, to convince is yourself. You have to give yourself permission. I don't, um, no, these are great. And what, what, what I'll do is I'll put them in our show notes. I also think it's a difficult question to ask. It, this question is the most difficult for me to ask because uh, so many times the author will give me this phenomenal quote and then I'm just supposed to move on to the next question. And it's like, oh, man, you know, I, quotes are something that you take the time to resonate and really think through and, and, uh, and, and make sense to yourself. And so it, it's difficult for me yeah. to uh, sometimes well, as you just said, listen to I don't think in quotes, I think in terms of stories. And I mm -hmm. think that I think that rather than one quote, I feel like what I tried to do is use stories that surprised me and inspired me and try to tell them a way that in a way that could be relatable, um, no matter where the person was coming from, whether they were starting and thinking of starting a business, already started a business, didn't want to start a business at all, but just wanted to be a little bit uh, more innovative and entrepreneurial within their, their existing organization. So I think that that's back to what you were saying about storytelling that that's where that's where my mind was excellent well linda there's no doubt that your book will be uh you know create paradigm shifts for different individuals um like i said there's so much entrepreneurial and awesome mindset that you go through in this book and so now i'm asking you for a similar type thing. i'm asking you if there was only one book you could recommend based on the way that it impacted your life maybe created a paradigm shift for you uh, helped you move on what what would you recommend well, most recently, I love the book Wonder that my children brought me, and it is it is a wonderful book about uh, about a nine year old boy uh, with facial deformities and how he is accepted in school. And I think every parent and every child should read this book by R. J. Palacio, a fellow Brooklynite. I think that that is um, fantastic. Um, I remember reading the the. Uh, story, the biograph autobiography of Catherine Graham, 
And I really didn't know much about her story. I knew, obviously, about the Washington Post. And um, most business books, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of history and about business books, and most of them are written, you know, um, by men, and which is great, and I love all of them. But I remember being surprised by both her strength, but also back to her, you know, her vulner vulnerability and talking about times when she was really scared and when she didn't really know the business she was getting into. And, and I, I remember that having a profound impact. Excellent. I haven't got that one referenced yet, so I always love hearing brand new books. And Linda, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also grab some information on your book, Crazy as a Compliment? Yeah, they can uh, go to Linda, lindarotenberg.com, uh, Twitter, I'm on at Linda Rotenberg, and then also endeavor.org if you're interested in Endeavor's work. So all of those things work. It's Rotenberg, two T's, but pronounced Rotenberg. Will you give us a quick plug on, uh, I always tell authors this isn't a plug-free zone, it's a plug-away zone. <laughs> will, will, will you give us a quick plug on... Uh, on Endeavor and what you guys uh, do, just in case there's someone out there listening right now that actually needs what you guys provide. Yeah, Endeavor operates now, as I said, in 22 countries. We also actually launched in Miami a year ago and now are about to launch in Detroit and Louisville. So we're, we are bringing our scale-up model for ecosystems that we used in countries now to U.S. cities as well. And we're looking for entrepreneurs in these. We have to have operations there, at, but in any industry who have uh, had some traction but really think they can be the next big thing in whatever industry they're in but need help getting to getting through that scale-up phase. Um, so uh, Endeavor is all about helping those high-impact, high-growth entrepreneurs, the gazelles, so to speak. And then uh, really the crazy as a compliment is for the book for anyone in your life that has a dream uh, but needs a little bit of courage or, or motivation to get going. Excellent. Well, Linda, you did a fantastic job today breaking oh, down your book. You. And, and thank you so much for coming on and sharing it with us. My pleasure. Happy holidays. Thanks again for listening in today. If you'd like a chance to win this book by Linda, Crazy as a Compliment, uh, just go become a VIP. It's on our homepage, the elpodcast.com. And you can also go to the show notes if you want more information on Linda or her book. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.